right up here. Hi, um, I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the MCA. My name is Susan Music. I work in the education department here um, at the museum. And thank you for coming tonight to our talk. Um, season support for our MCA lecture and conversation series is generously provided by the Albert Pick Jr. Fund. Support for MCA lectures has been provided in part by Blanche Koffler, Alzheimer and Gray, Aon Corporation, Mr. and Mrs. Alan Harris, Ione Caney, Renee Logan, Leah and Ralph Wanger, Leonor Wexler, Eleanor Stone Bellick, James H. Stone, and Cynthia Raskin. Um, this talk this evening is presented in partnership with Chicago Women in Architecture, and we work with them on an annual basis to bring in a speaker or speakers that are of interest to the museum community and also to Chicago Women in Architecture. Chicago Women in Architecture is a not-for-profit volunteer organization that exists as a forum for women in architecture and related, and related professions. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my a colleague, Lina Gregitis, who is the lecture chair of Chicago Women in Architecture. I felt she was more appropriate to introduce our speakers tonight, so I turn you over to Lena. Susan, thank you for those kind words, and thank you very, very much for coming. We are very excited to have Lorinda Spear and Marissa Fort with us tonight. We would especially like to thank the Museum of Contemporary Art for collaborating with the Chicago Women in Architecture in making tonight's event a reality. In addition to tonight's event, the Chicago Women in Architecture meet on the second Tuesday of every month in the Dirt Showroom. We are organizing an event in August. Uh, it's a networking event. Um, Hapala America is organizing a special presentation for the CWA on Monday, September 10th. The presentation will be Women of Influence, the Achievements of Women in Chicago's Early History. Everyone is invited to attend these events and more information can be found at www.cwarch.org. Now, a couple words about tonight's presentation. The Museum of Contemporary Art and the Chicago Women in Architecture both agreed to invite Lorinda Spear and Marissa Fort to give us a presentation because we are huge fans of these women and their work. Ms. Spear is a founding principal of Architectonica and has been the main design force behind her firm's unique and varied approach to design for many years. Her firm has a worldwide established practice in the fields of architecture and planning. Ms. Spear established Architectonica Interiors, which now has a firm place in the Interior Design Hall of Fame. Ms. Spear also created the design products group, Lorinda Spear Products, which has over 150 products on the market under dozens of global brands. Ms. Spear established a landscape architecture practice, Architectonica Geo, focusing on environmental land and landscape design. Quite simply, here are the highlights of the highlights of the hundreds of awards Architectonica has won over the years. AIA Florida Firm of the Year, AIA Test of Time Award, numerous American, Architect American Institute of Architects awards. Architectonica's work has been featured in nearly 3,000 national and international publications, such as Time, Newsweek, Life, Fortune, and Business Week, as well as numerous professional journals, such as Architectural Record, Progressive Architecture, Architectural Design, Domus, Global Architecture, Abitere, and others. Like I said, those are the highlights of the highlights. She is now collaborating with her daughter, Marissa Fort, and these two women are just a force of energy. Marissa Fort has her own list of achievements, including, but not limited to, a Harvard education and an entire lifetime of personal and professional experiences with a top design firm. Tonight, we have Architectonica's mother-daughter team of Lorinda Spear and Marissa Fort to tell us about how these fantastic achievements are achieved. We present the ladies of Architectonica, Lorinda Spear and Marissa Fort. Thank you.
Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the nice introduction. We're really happy to be here and share this lecture with you because it's a test lecture. We've never given it before. So some of the ideas um, are new to us, to you. This is my first lecture of this sort ever, so it's really a test lecture. <laughs> so we made an armature for this lecture, which is a little different, so you just have to follow it along and it'll get to some kind of conclusion. If the acoustics are better, if it's too loud or too soft, sort of tell us and maybe they can adjust. Louder, okay. Okay, better, better. Okay, complain about the anything you want to. <laughs> okay. This lecture is called Multitasking, Architecture Against the Gauntlet. And to introduce the concept of multitasking, we would like to introduce those of you who are not familiar with the Hindu goddess Durga to her. She is, from her Wikipedia description, depicted as having many arms and carrying many types of weapons and a lotus flower, always accompanied by a lion and always maintaining a smile. An embodiment of creative feminine force, Durga manifests fearlessness, patience, and compassion, never losing her sense of humor, even during spiritual battles of epic proportion. As a goddess, Durga's feminine power contains the combined energies of all the gods. Each of her weapons was given to her by various gods, her trident, discus, thunderbolt, sword, bow, and shell. And to reward her own army's loyalty, Durga bestowed upon them the knowledge of jewelry making. Durga was undoubtedly a great multitasker and for thousands of years, only gods were required to do so many things at once. But all that changed from the previous generation to mine. In August of 1969, Woodstock finally woke everyone up to a new way of life. The event was a hybrid of a music festival, an art fair, a political rally, a new type of social statement, and a big party. It was, in a way, a celebration of multitasking. From that point on, people found it harder and harder to sit around a room single-tasking together, as they had for so many years. Today, we've all become multitaskers, whether we like it or not. And since we can all manage to find a way to multitask, we think our architecture should multitask as well. We strive for total integration in our architecture, which to us is when everything comes together. Client, site, programs, timing. This is when all aspects of a building can be considered from top to bottom, master planning, landscape, architecture, interiors, products. The integrated project con contrasts a project designed in pieces with many different notions of what the building needs to be. With total integration, a concept can be expressed more clearly, a statement can be more powerful and coherent. Next, we'll show projects designed and built under the best case scenario. These are examples of integrated buildings. The American Airlines Arena is a fantastic example of an integrated design for a building and its extended site. It was a great opportunity for Architectonica to consider how a building would be seen from all sides, from towers yet to exist, from an airplane, the water, the highway, and from its interior. A paving pattern runs from the sidewalk through the building, out the other side, linking the city to the bay. This arena was one of the first to incorporate large expanses of glazing and views from inside the arena out to its surroundings a big change in arena design. The seating bowl has a heat wave pattern with custom carpets and seats. We designed the doors that separate the suites, the bars, 
the lounges, and the restaurants. Here is a view from a club overlooking the court. The main concourse was divided into four quadrants, each with its own distinct patterning and identity to help fans remember where they are. The locker rooms were given a fittingly dramatic chapel-like design. The site plan of the arena was the generator that energized the entire neighborhood. All of the projects in green are projects of ours that happened as a direct or indirect result of the arena, and projects by other firms that came as a result of the arena are in gray. This makes a kind of constellation of new construction in the neighborhood. The most recent for us was the water line. The client for the water line wanted to build an iconic destination on the Miami waterfront. The boardwalk was inspired by the mangroves along the coast that function as barriers during hurricane season. This project connects the landscape with the bay and converts it into a vibrant and contemporary destination. The public could finally have its walkable waterfront, something that has been sorely missing from Miami for a long time. This is a master plan in Dijon, outside of the old center of the city, focused around the construction of a new opera and Palais de Congrès, and including an expansion of the Parc des Expositions, new office space, hotels, and limited retail. Slowly, all the pieces are being built. The opera itself is made of local stone and reaches across a street allowing cars to pass underneath. An oculus lightens the large overhead mass for pedestrians and drivers who pass below the bridge lobby. Climbing the stairs inside, people can access a balcony with a wrought iron railing enclosing it. The auditorium has a bold pattern in wood. A similar wood pa pattern is expressed on the outside of the hall. And throughout the building, its plan inspired the detailing all the way down to the doorknobs. The Expo and Palais were companion buildings with consistent architectural features to their big brother, the Opera. In Luxembourg, we designed this bank campus years ago, to which we've recently added. Not only did we do a modern building, but we were asked by the city to design an infill building as well which looks like an old 19th century structure. Much of the program is underground so that the heights of the new buildings match the heights of existing buildings along the street. A garden connects the old and the new. We also designed the conference tables that uniquely fit each meeting room. The new addition carries on the theme of the original. We were asked by the bank to design a less formal, more everyday wing of the building. It's just finishing construction and will link with the first bank building. Through Dream Glass 2. We again designed the reconfigurable tables used throughout. Cyberport is an incubator for startup companies in Asia where people can rent space and in doing so become part of a like-minded community. It has many amenities a library and cafes, meeting spaces and a gym, a high-speed wireless network throughout, and a hotel for visiting guests. It was built in conjunction with a phased housing project of eight block towers and additional freestanding homes. Similar to the American Airlines concourse, we created a sense of place throughout the Dragon's Tail by changing the theme with color and pattern. The building is very large, so we had to articulate the facades in unique but complementary ways. The design wanders down the hillside like a long body of a dragon, following feng shui principles. Here is one part of the building that bridges over the street to join the other. The patterns unite the building in the garden and the lobbies and the interiors. You can see that while we use a complementary language, each space distinguishes itself from the others. So those were some examples of the best case scenario projects. 
of total integration. These buildings, they raised the standards of their neighborhoods in countless ways. But every Architectonica building makes an effort to multitask regardless of the situation. The integrated projects had many opportunities to multitask, but these don't come along every day. Most of the time we need to choose a particular area to concentrate our efforts on so that a building multitasks very well in one or two ways or three ways instead of in, in, many, ways, in many diluted ways. And what we mean by multitask is that in addition to addressing the needs of the client and users, the building does some other things, whether that be for the neighborhood, the site, or the environment. We can break these, strateg these strategies into four loose categories. A diamond in the rough, which elevates neglected, na ne ne neglected neighborhoods through their energizing presence. Projects that bring the outside in, which pull its surroundings, most often nature, into the building from the outside. Inside out projects, which have a limited program and so use their exterior to convey an image or symbol. And repurposing projects, which create alternate uses of a building and are designed with their potential future functions in mind. We think that the difference between standard building and architecture is a building's ability to multitask and that through multitasking, the building is elevated to the level of architecture. So every project we design attempts to multitask in some way. In order to do so, it must go through a grueling gauntlet of approvals and constraints. And every project, no matter how large or small, from a private house down to a downtown master plan, has to survive the gauntlet to be built. The gauntlet is always pushing multitasking architecture back into a boring box. An architect needs to remain loyal to the building's concept and insist on multitasking, which requires a great deal of fortitude. South of Lima, Peru, the La Jolla project offers a great example of how powerful even limited opportunities for multitasking can be. In this case, the environment and setting was valued as much as the clients and users. Along a coast of rough beaches and cold waters, our client wanted to develop a resort neighborhood with a private lagoon. In between two beautiful expanses, the Pacific Ocean to the west and the desert to the east, the architecture respects its setting and enhances it where possible. Green technology allowed us to propose a crystal clear freshwater lagoon with a private white sand beach, a true oasis. The master plan focused on creating a system of pedestrian and bike routes around the lagoon, which is big enough to practice sailing, water skiing, and other water sports. The linear gardens allow, gar allow residents to move with ease to and from the lagoon. Grade changes create permanent views to the lagoon and Pacific Ocean beyond. The lagoon, along with the base uh, in infrastructure, was recently completed and awaits the architecture. Some of our projects are diamonds in the rough, meaning that they're in ignored neighborhoods and they somehow create a sense of excitement to help revive their neighborhoods. We'll show three clear examples of this. The Bronx Museum was originally a dilapidated temple that did nothing to contribute to street life. Originally intended to be a renovation, the museum was ultimately built almost from the ground up. It became a focal point in the Bronx, a place where people come from everywhere to visit and where locals get together for special events. We wanted to design the interiors to defer to the art on display. The resulting architecture was simple and powerful. The South Dade Performing Arts Center is of similar size as the Bronx Museum, but it's in a very different type of neglected neighborhood. It backs up to a drainage canal with parking lots on all sides, a police station and a trash disposal plant flanking it, and a big mall across the street. A site plan shows the paving and landscaping reaching down to the canal and finding its way into the building. It has become a point of pride for the community. Both local and visiting artists perform here. We designed the building, the curtain, the patterns on the seats, and the patterns on the carpet. An education center was also built next door as a sister project and provides space for local community classes. 
Originally a landfill, the site of Biscayne Landing is in North Miami Beach between Olita National Park and US-1. It was selected by the US government as a pilot project for lead neighborhood development. The large mass of mangroves bordering the site on the east was the inspiration for the urban landscape. The client requested an iconic entrance to the project. GEO proposed a series of berms shaped like gigantic mangrove, leaf, mangrove leaves in plan that served three purposes. To create a distinct entrance, to provide protection for bikers and pedestrians, especially from vehicular traffic, and to create attractive noise abatement features. Underground parking is lit naturally during the day through glass bricks on the sidewalk, which conversely light the sidewalk at night. The landscaping frames the urban architecture. Biscayne Landing can also be seen through its ability to sustainably relate development to nature. As often as possible, we focus on infusing buildings with nature so that they are no longer standalone buildings but actually reach out into the landscape. We've done many outside-in projects and we'll only show you six. The Puerta Triana project is located along the Guadalquivir River in Sevilla, Spain, on the 1994 Expo site across from the old city. The inspiration for this project came from Spanish flamenco attire. Set within a master plan that reaches across the river with a park, Architectonica designed a green building capable of producing 20% of its own energy and exceeding the maximum points for lead platinum sat status. The building grows out of the landscape. Wetlands were restored to the site and functioned to filter the rainwater flowing back into the river and also the gray water from the building. One of the first times we could experiment with green facades was with the Ballet Valley parking garage, which became a model for parking garages in Miami Beach. A historic street facade was renovated and reconstructed, and on top of that is the parking garage and its green facades. This is a new building on the Florida International University campus that recently opened, in which we thought about all five facades of the building, including the roof, as we often do. The building has an extensive green roof, the largest in the southeast at over 9,000 square feet. From the ground, the building is a sculptural object, but from higher up in the building and from other buildings around it, the footprint is replaced by the large green roof. The design tactic for SM City in Manila added value to a structure that would otherwise be a normal parking and transportation hub in the middle of the city. Architectonica Geo proposed a living roof an outside destination that would tie the existing mall to an outdoor shopping experience. Given the climate, a series of mounds create protection from the sun and rain and house restrooms, shops, and cafes. Water was used throughout the site as a vital element to buffer nearby traffic noise. Banco de Credito's headquarters building in Lima, Peru was an early project that had to fit into a distinct landscape at the foot of the hills in East Lima. Using the Spanish colonial courtyard buildings in the area as inspiration, we designed the headquarters building with a courtyard, in this case a much larger courtyard than is typical. It opens to the back towards the hilltops and encloses a lush garden which has grown far beyond <coughs> what we'd ever imagined when we designed it. The courtyard facades and the outside facades of the building are made of different materials to reflect different design intents. The outside is modern and sleek, while the inside uses a more rugged local slate with a looser elevation. A glass block cylinder creates an entrance atrium and frames a panoramic view of Lima. This is our new global headquarters. We moved in in October 2010. We spent a long time thinking about this building and once we started, one of the main considerations was making it pass through the gauntlet as quickly and painlessly as possible. <clears throat> when we got through the permitting process and were ready to build, the, the, the office was really more of a boring, boxy building than a piece of architecture. So very unlike what we normally do, we changed the windows, left off the stucco, stripped down to the interiors, and we were left with a very raw, expressive, basic building, which was really has become an asset to the neighborhood and to the office, even inspiring clients whenever they visit. 
Large operable windows and sliding interior doors create cross breezes across the work corridors and limit art artificial light usage. Instead of extending a new pattern outward, we brought the brick sidewalk paving into our publicly accessible courtyard using a nicer, more durable brick. On the interior, we exposed the ductwork, wiring, and unfinished walls. Our architects are screened from sun and public view by a new community vegetable garden. Using a single window design and rotating it, we created a var variety in the window patterns with an efficient use of means. Some buildings, often political in nature, have very strict interior and programmatic requirements, and instead of pulling the outside in, they attempt to express all the action contained inside them in their interior, exteriors. Excuse me. A Manhattan skyscraper, a federal courthouse, and an American embassy are great cases of these highly restrictive, restricted programs. The Westin in Times Square was not the moment to do a tasteful building. As part of a massive resuscitation of the Times Square neighborhood, then in progress, um, this building was designed. The neighborhood was in pretty bad shape at the time. The image of the building had to generate the same excitement as Times Square itself. We had to adhere to what we understood as fundamental characteristics of Times Square, polychrome, pop culture, contradiction, and exuberance. A palette of five colors extends from the interiors outward to the bright exterior. This is the street entrance, the front desk in the main lobby, and the waiting area next to it. Patterns reappear throughout the hotel. The wall treatment in the elevator lobby comes back in some of the conference rooms and elsewhere. In this lobby, the exterior streak running up the tower can be seen on the inside. This is one of the elevators which were given their own personality. This is a pre-function spade and another. And finally, here you can see one side of the bar and the other side, which faces out over 8th Avenue. The US Federal Courthouse in Miami is a great example of the fact that in political buildings, you deal with so many gauntlet issues. We had to incorporate courtrooms, judges' chambers, and offices of the U.S. Marshals, among other things. The building was divided into two parts, representing the at least two sides to every story in court. Activity on the inside is expressed on the facade for architectural transparency to the public. The site is bisected by an access road where the building elevates to allow for the passage of trucks. A central cone of varying shades of blue glass pierces the middle of the building and ends in a cafeteria. The cafeteria is raised high above the ground for increased security. This is the main lobby and the lights that run along the hallways. Here is an entrance to a courtroom and the interior of a courtroom. In the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru, we used a melange of thematic U.S. graphics mixed with pre-Columbian textile images. In response to the extremely intense security restrictions, the building is like a fortress. Bold patterning takes advantage of largely blank facades with small windows. The exterior is both modern and referential to patterns 3,000 years old. The grand entrance, the most prominent feature of the building's front facade, is bordered with different types of metal and stone. To distinguish the doors from their massive frame, they have their own unique texture. A U.S. flag motif envelops the entrance lobby, and ancient Peruvian textile patterns are expressed in the floors of the consular area. But the most sustainable type of architecture is repurposed architecture where a building is being transformed to serve an entirely new purpose. This part of the idea that a building needs to be flexible and adaptable if it wants to continue to multitask for decades to come, some of our projects are repurposed old buildings and some are designed to be repurposed, but the point is to incorporate change while maintaining an architectural identity. This was originally the headquarters for a, project, a tech company called IXL. 
When IXL moved out and Savannah College of Art and Design moved in, they hardly had to change anything except the signs. The interiors remained the same, and this was primarily an interiors product pro and products project all along. In fact, some of the products and wall treatments designed for this project continue to be manufactured today. Similarly, the Decorative Arts Building in Miami became the Design and Architecture Senior High School with almost no change. Through the transition, they have only needed to add a fence to the front. But the plaza has remained the same and works just as well. Alman Hall is a mixed-use development on 164 acres in the heart of Abu Dhabi. This site inhabits the former palace of Sheikh Said bin Sultan. His abandoned palace and majestic gardens inspired the idea for a central park. The repurposing of this building into the Natural History Museum highlights the history of the palace for the community. This central park is seen today as a vital component of the overall urban strategy for the city. Its design invites interaction from the streets, embracing the urban context. This project takes a modern approach to incorporate nature and urbanity into an area full of history and cultural significance. Although we, we always hope to design buildings that are totally integrated in every way, the opportunity is rare. Instead, we take what we can get from each gauntlet we face. In the end, every building can't be totally integrated, but by multitasking in as many ways as possible, each can do more than they're asked to do. And that's exactly the type of architecture we should be making today, a multitasking architecture that keeps up with our busy lives. Multitasking elevates architecture from standard building. And with a little more awareness from designers, hopefully we'll start seeing architecture that instead of catering exclusively to the demands of the market, reflects our contemporary lifestyles. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay. Does anyone have any questions? I'll bring the mic over. Nobody? Oh, okay. Here we go. Now I'll come back down. Um, I grew up in Miami, and I've admired your work for a very long time, from the, almost the beginning. But I was looking at your offices that look fabulous, and I love the way that they're pared down just to the raw elements. But when you have that interior courtyard that you then open up to all the offices, what do you do about the palmetto bugs and the lizards? Well, I mean, in Florida, we like the lizards because they eat all the other critters, so that's a good thing. And um, we don't seem to have a lot of palmetto bugs. But, I mean, we're not squeamish about insects, anyway. <laughs> Very nice presentation. I'm just curious, you know, we're all working under strict budgets these days. And how do you work within a budget, and are you obligated to meet certain targets, and who do you employ to help you arrive at that budget? The contractors, how really are they involved? Um, I'm just curious as to how that cycle comes into play when you're making your design decisions. Well, I'll start off by saying that that's a gauntlet issue for sure, you know, because that's one of the criteria you have to pass through to get a building built all the time. Usually, and often, we bring a contractor or a, you know, estimator on board very early. For example, um, we're designing a project for University of Miami, and it's only a schematic design, and we've already brought in the contractor to tell us what, what seems expensive to him, so we can adjust it a little as we work. Any, any other questions? You have a variety of uh, sizes of projects, the small buildings, the uh, skyscrapers, and then uh, a lot of uh, urban planning and redevelopment. Do you uh, personally, uh, and I'd like to hear from both of you, if you have uh, a personal preference. Marissa? I definitely like working on projects that are near me in Miami more because I can see them through very closely. Um, but it al it's also really fun and eye-opening to work on the projects that are larger and international because you really gain a new perspective on 
all manner of things, just even cultural things, new, just you get a whole different sort of viewpoint, I guess, when you work on the other larger projects that aren't in your backyard. But working on the projects in your backyard means you can check on them every day and see what's going on and talk to the people putting them together and I enjoy that aspect of it a lot. Within the architecture program, you know, we did do some urban planning, yes, and I did take some, I, I did take a course within the landscape architecture program with Carl Steinitz, which was basically an urban planning studio. So yes. And my answer is, I mean, I love designing anything, whether it's, it's a huge building or a tiny little doorknob. So I'm very happy at all scales. I mean, I love textile design. I mean, I can just design anything and feel just as happy. So it all is great. Anybody else? Any questions? Well, thank you again so much. Thank you all. Thank you for having us.